Okay, we'll have to deal with that. All right, welcome. Nice to see everyone jumping in. This is a fun class because I we've been working together on enough classes that it's kind of like a reunion every time. Uh, so I have for an agenda tonight a uh, visualization of self updates and I guess it's, it's working on focusing. Um, and uh, I know there's got some interesting stuff cooking in that department. So I know at least Joanne has something perhaps to share out. And one of the things that's useful about the project updates is a chance for us to cross pollinate um, intellectually as we go about our design. So I'd like to revisit that and see where we are. Then uh, if people have any updates from uh, the index project that we started last week and we had some great examples of some creative indexing then I will give an example Tufty chapter project so I was assigned chapter one so I prepared a um, my sample activity for that which we'll uh, do that'll probably be about a half hour um, and then we're going to get to pivoting, pivoting charts and tables, and then we'll have time for questions as needed. How's that sound? Any nominations for changes? All right. Um, so welcome those of you that are just hopping on. I've got recording going, and um, you can drop your attendance in whenever, um, uh, whenever you get to it. And we're sorry to see Aaron not feeling well. So I'm a little bit behind on my posting videos, but I have a new wind in me and I got four posted today. So I'm going to try to stay on top of that a little bit better. Um, I've gone round and round about what the right workflow is and do I want to just upload to the cloud and send a link out. And every time I think about it, I realize that uh, I just can't stand to think of CCAC when they get rid of me, they'll just take all my data and it'll be gone. So I really, I really have to have the files myself and, and put them up, otherwise I'll lose them. So I appreciate your patience on that. If you're ever in a position where um, you're sitting down to work and you really need them, call me and leave a message if you don't get me and say, please post the video and I will do it first thing um, if I have it. So again, I appreciate your patience on that. So let's um, pull up, visualize, are visualizing ourself, uh, our little module page, and the tracker that goes with it. So we'll do a little, um, we'll do a tracker update on this. I still mean to get us our own little section. I hope you don't take offense that we're there is a subsection under under data analytics. It uh, came out that way. So so here we are on. Uh, 28. So these should be flipped from a um, an agenda standpoint. So let's pop into Visualize Yourself project and let's pop open our tracker. If you'd all join me there, and let's just get a a a check in here. Contact the spreadsheet owner. I'm the spreadsheet owner. If you don't think I'm the spreadsheet owner, that's the problem. I need to open this in my other browser that's wired to Google. Wow, Google is, they've, they're so much, so much better than OneDrive. My goodness gracious. Um, okay, so let's do, we've frozen our rows. So let's pop over to, um, Oh yeah, factor model. So we're thinking about that. Do we have, oh Eric, good, you got your factor model. Um, so let's do an update here. Update 28 SEP. So um, A will be, uh, do you have an instrument? Uh, B, have you test driven data collection? Um, C, 
questions. Uh, let me make that a little wider. So column J, if you can populate uh, column J, please, while we get settled in here, I'm gonna pop open what we've got for factor models to inspire. Um, remember, the I, I acknowledge the project cycle, and so I want I want this project to be meaningful so that um, I don't want anyone to feel bad that they're not in the right spot. I just want you to keep uh, picking away at it. Um, and so that's why we'll do these updates to get you thinking. Um, ooh, look. Cool. This is Eric. Awesome. A jobs repercussions on mood and energy. Nice title. That's the title that'll get people clicking. Look at this nice markdown. So this is a lovely graph. We need, let's, your next phase is to make it directional. So are we saying energy is impacting physical and mental state? Is mood impacting physical and mental state? I wonder about um, teasing apart mental state versus mood, uh, which you could certainly do, um, but that would be a, from a measurement standpoint, the factors that we brainstorm, I would say brainstorm a bunch of factors and then isolate the ones that are most measurable and most relevant and then find, uh, figure out how to record that. So nice work on this. This is a, a great place to start. Um, got Mr. Gilbert. Any comments on that, Eric? This is the start of what I was, it's just a sim very simple uh, picture. I w it was, yeah, it's a very simple start, honestly. That's where we want to start, start simple. Um, I, I really like it, I think it's really good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so if one way to think, this also could be, uh, are you saying here that the mental state index would be a composition of energy and mood? Is yeah. That Great, great. Um, and do you have any clever ideas for measuring energy and mood? I was gonna um, have a thing where I measure my like uh, energy and mood together like three times throughout the day on work days and also not work days. And then also what like time of day I work to. So it's like kind of, it'll be more complex, but yeah. Just, uh, yeah. A research model that I found quite interesting when I was doing a lot more uh, data analysis is um, the, uh, randomizing the time in which you draw those kinds of samples. So I'm sure you can get a tool that could pick out random times within Windows mm -hmm. um, to sample um, if what you're trying to get is capturing an average over a period of time. One way to do that without being burdensome in your data collection is to randomly sample within a range. Mm -hmm. And if you made it quick, like a little Google survey where you had three questions and they're on a, a rating scale, you could just pop them in uh, and move on with your life. So that would be, that would be very cool. Um, and uh, we've got, ooh, look at this. Mr. Gilbert, would you like to give us a rundown on what we're looking at? Um, I came up with four things that I think could affect my solve time. Only one of them I'm experimentally testing. That's the auditory stimuli. Um, other things that I thought could be impactful would be um, here, we'll start at the left, dietary supplements. So no caffeine, um, regularly eating to account for, you know, any kind of fluctuations in my body. Um, uh, at the bottom is the amount of sleep the previous night. I have noticed that if I don't get a full night to sleep, well, my whole day is kind of ruined. So <laughs> that one need to be um, accounted for or at least noted for whatever day I collect time. And then external stressors, I thought that I could control this by just doing five minutes of meditation. So just simple breathing. Yeah. Great. And uh, music. Right. Yeah. So that's going to be or my experiments. I'm going to be doing um, silence, just wearing earplugs or I will be listening to my preferred um, genre of music, or I'll be listening to classical, like Mozart, that kind of stuff. Right, and so remember, we've got already with our two um, little diagrams we've looked at, 
Um, seems like Mr. Gilbert is uh, very much potentially able to create an experimental model. Do you have ideas about trying to isolate the treatments somehow, or are you looking to do more of an observational study um, without attempting to isolate uh, experimentally these different inputs? Do you have an idea on that? You mean other than the auditory? Um, yes. So would you be deliberately changing your dietary supplement? No. And, okay. So my plan is to keep the other three constant, um, only trying to account for the different music. Great. Yeah, so there's your experimental model. Of if we hold, you find the fa major factors that drive your solve time and isolate the one that you're going to adjust. So you will deliberately then choose to test yourself with silence, metacore, metalcore, or classical. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Um, looks like we've got a 404 on one of them. Um, and uh, we're good. We've got a couple other pop up. Did we look at Rachel? Let's can we look at yours? Yeah. It's just a picture. Oh, maybe uh, not. Let's see I if I can. I don't See know if I can hunt it down. Oh no. That's why oh, I tried no. to do that. <laughs> uh, might be able to get in there. Oh, somehow I think you might have defaulted to private. I noticed that the Microsoft Corporation has now decided to make their default uh, repository status private. I was so sad when I I did a sample repository today, and they did it. Unprivate. Make it. Oh, there it they, is. How do I? It should be under settings for your repo. I'm going to close it all up. Um, interesting. Um, and then, uh, Joanne, do you want to walk us through um, what you were what we were chatting about the other night? Sure. Sorry, it's muted. Okay. Um, I'm I am. Screen sharing if you want. <clears throat> yeah, I'll screen share. Right now, I'm stuck. I am running into an error on um, time zone. Um, so I want to, my project is to log the interruptions that I have at work and determine whether or not the interruptions that I'm having on work are really having an effect on my mood and whether or not I you know, when I have a lot of interruptions, is it causing problems with my mood or is it possibly something else? So just um, writing a quick Python script um, that I can run. Uh, it's just going to look for a key press, log the date and time of the key press to start uh, the interruption, and then ask me for what type of interruption it was, whether it's a phone call or yeah. uh, instant message or um, a visitor coming to my office, whatever. And then at the end, it'll ask me to calculate, you know, or, or quantify how I am feeling. Um, so then I can go back and look at how many times I was interrupted that day and see how those may correlate or not correlate. Um, so right now I am getting stuck on a time zone info uh, in my class for date. Uh, in your constructor. Yeah, in my constructor. So I'm kind of uh, bashing my head against that one. Um, but Has anyone tinkered with Python time? I have not. Anybody? Anybody? I have wrestled. I have spent many, many a week wrestling in Java land. Um, <laughs> In fact, I was wrestling in Java land when Java land improved their own uh, time API to something dramatically simpler. Um, I was end up having to convert everything down to milliseconds since Epic and then back into some other format and it was different from my front end and my back end. So I, um, I sympathize. Um, so if uh, maybe we'll have a little bit debug time at the end, but this is a great idea. That's cool. yeah. uh, so I've got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of the code written. I had, had a version written before, as you can see, I had some other stuff written in here, but um, I didn't like how it was functioning. I wanted something real easy that I could just hit any key um, yeah. to do it so I didn't have to pay attention so I could 
more accurately log like when my interruption started. Yeah. Because I also want to get the the time delta on them, which is why I'm using the the date time uh, information, uh, so I can get the time delta on the beginning and end of my interruptions. Perfect. And what's your what's your working theory? Um, my working theory is that yeah, it does impact me because I'm feel frustrated because I'm not getting done what I set out to get done because I'm being interrupted so many times. But I don't know. Maybe and then is there else. is there a um I'm assuming at some point you're also trying to track progress on the larger goals that are being interrupted. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. This is neat. And so building a tool like that, that's a great example of uh, kind of a bite-sized thing that is great for scripting um, and lends itself very well because that program can sit there running all day, just hit the space the moment it comes in or whatever your key is and very cool. So that's what I mean by thinking about a beta tool, which is, is it going to be, uh, you know, what, what is the, what is the mechanism? So Brandon will probably be developing a data sheet for tracking your individual solve um, attempts and, and, um, and that kind of thing. So cool. Um, questions uh, so far on the, on the project as we go through. Let me jump back to uh, the overview page. So again, I think by the end of by the end of or September, beginning of uh, October, we definitely want you to have a beta tool um, in the works. So, um, and I really love the the uh, markdown that we're seeing. The key to documentation I've learned the hard way is to do it as you go. So I love I love the headers that Eric already built. Um, that's uh, surprising how relieving it can be to have headers in such a pre-design. One of the best tips I got for research papers was when you sit down to write it, start by writing an outline, get as much out onto an outline as you can before even digging in necessarily to sources in some in-depth model. Um, having something on a page, having some progress, at least in my brain, I can get overwhelmed very, very easily by things. And so having something there avoids the panic of the, the blank page. Um, and that can be very useful in, in uh, almost any project endeavor, uh, whether it's physical or digital. So um, very neat. These, these, are these um, draw.io? That looks like a draw.io diagram. Um, so remember that diagrams.net can be your best friend in um, making diagrams. So don't forget that one. All right, nothing else on visualize yourself. Um, once again, take some time in uh, this project overview page and uh, think about which ones you can start working on. And again, phase two is kind of where we are, tool building um, and, and coming up with scaling for qualitative uh, reports and so forth. So I'll give you some uh, ideas and then, and then try it. It's really important that we do a, an attempt. So probably next week, I'll make it a deliverable to have some data gathered over the course of the next week in a data table, however rough it is, um, giving it a try uh, is almost always revealing uh, challenges. It either takes too long, um, the scales weren't right, uh, it didn't seem to be capturing a dynamic that you were hoping to try to capture. All those things come up in the beta phase and we want to practice that cycle as thoroughly as we can. All right, cool. Um, Next, what's up next? Index. So, um, anyone want to share any progress that they made on their um, Wikipedia indexes or interesting findings? We spent a good chunk of time last time, but I'm I'm so inspired by the kind of stuff you're doing. It's really fun to share them out. We had Paula's was a reference um, index for us, and I appreciate all of your hard work there. So let me. Pop that open. Um, were we using we were using this right? 
our spreadsheet. Everyone had a tab. Or did they go in separate? I think we probably did. We did them in the Google Drive, I think. Yeah, it's a separate link. Ah, uh, Google Doc. Uh, did I put it over here? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm doing okay with keeping all this stuff straight. Uh, we're getting there. Anyone uh, feel good about some of the work they did? They want to share it out or uh, would you rather just move on? Yeah, we can do mine. I did. Okay. I got that all cleared up. Could you screen share it yourself so you can drive? Yeah, sure. Uh, mm. Yep, so I did it pretty straightforward, you know. Um, the weightings, I did sections, you know, number of sections, which is, you know, it seemed like it could be kind of a toss up just because. <laughs> You know, some section, not, not all sections are made equal, I guess. Um, yeah. But the weighting I gave on that was a quarter, just saying, okay, number of ads. I didn't know what to, how to feel about this, um, just because, um, you know, you can have a really good website that only makes its money through ads. You know, I mean, that's a pretty common way for a company to make its money. So I gave that like a negative 0.1. The real weighting... Um, I was able to throw the URL, the website, into a word count, just website. Oh, yeah. Like, it could be an approximate value, but, like, this ended up being, like, the majority, like, kind of the, the main qualifying, just basically the, the main difference maker. I mean, you can see, actually, it's by pretty huge margin that, um, you know, how, how many words or how long the articles actually were with how, was how it got judged. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I guess probably how I could have improved on this was maybe putting more into, I mean, section, number of sections and the, you know, the word count are probably going to be kind of probably closely related. You know, I mean, the highest weighted score here was this one at 15, but yeah, and the weighted score was second highest. So it, it could, you know, I could have probably put a little bit more into this or a different field, but I thought that. Um, it felt kind of neat to, you know, do the word count and have that. Yeah. Way to do it. Yep. Now, can we, can we try a, some real time editing here? Yeah. Um, so one thing that is fun about indices is trying to be able to change dynamically the weighting. And so what I would encourage you to do, and we can try it right now is just instead of hard coding your weights there, mm -hmm. let's, uh, put it in a single cell over to the right. Yeah. Okay. Your variables, and then we can actually tinker with the weighting and see how the scores evolve. And I'm going to encourage you to use a um, a named range value. So start by jumping over, like over on column N or O, and uh -huh. let's make uh, a little table here that's uh, like factor name, and then uh, one column over would be the factor weight, and then this is a a good little spreadsheet tip um, if you haven't if you're not in the habit of doing these so let's let's put your factors in there so we've got sections ads and word count and then let's transfer your numbers into column uh, P Just remind numbers in the column. Say that again. Yeah, just, just yeah. So then put put your point two five under column P. Yeah, yeah. Here, I'll, I'll just okay. Uh. And now right click the right click P uh, three. The the actual weight. Yeah. And um. Oh, uh, this is. Microsoft. Now click, um, so see now in the upper left, right above that diagonal arrow where you see P3. Other, uh, uh, so get rid of the right click. That was Google. This is Microsoft. So go all the way to your left side of the page with that selected. See where P3 is uh, yeah. on the formula bar. The left of the formula bar. See P3? 
yeah. uh, erase that and call it section weight without a space. So you're naming that cell. Okay. Oh, come on. Oh, no. What did it say? I want to read it. If you're trying to get existing range, at this time you can not create new named ranges in the web version of Excel. This is what I'm talking well, about. Hold on, hold on a minute. <gasps> How do they get away with this? They're, the, the, the Excel online. They keep oh. changing the features all the time. It's incredible. It's a, it's a train wreck. Um, anyways, well, naming ranges happens in every other spreadsheet. Hold on, let me download it, put it on Excel here. And I can do it. <laughs> and people pay all this money for it. It's incredible. Well, I'm getting this through the school. Yeah, we're paying. You're paying. We're paying like it's something like several hundred thousand dollars a year to the Microsoft Corporation for this. It's it's enormously expensive. Um, so now they even had the little box, and they're like, nope. Okay, so then we can call that. And so right. now, yep, do those for those other ones. At least they brought back formula highlighting or format yeah, formula right. highlighting. All right, now what do I do? Okay, so then keep going with your other two. Section weight? Yep. Oh, no, no, that's yeah, where you can name, you'll name it add weight. No, add weight. Yeah. Good. Okay, now in, in your weight cells, all you have to do is type equals in one of them. Uh, uh -huh. Do the first formula before you change, before you formula paste. So equals section weight. See how it comes up? What did it say? Did you capitalize it properly? Hold on. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Now you can formula paste it. Although, yeah, good. Look at that control action. Great. It doesn't do shit, okay. We'll see now, did that not work? It didn't work. No. Jesus I think you, Christ, I think can this be a little bit more useless? You should select the first one and then uh, copy it. And then before, and then select the ones you want to paste it to and then select format paste under paste special. Okay. Okay, I'm not wasting any more time. Okay. And so naming ranges like that is super helpful, um, especially when you want to figure out how big formulas are working. Um, Jesus Christ. Thanks for being a live guinea pig. Yeah, no problem. You're doing a great job. You can, I can tell you're an Excel whiz. Oh, for sure. Okay, so now let's try um, let's try underweighting word count. Try dropping, giving, maybe making a point oh oh five, and see if they start converging a bit. I'm surprised how few ads. Yeah, I know. Maybe we could do. Uh, no, I can't. I gotta. 
Yeah, so they did start to converge a little bit when we even underweighted word count a little bit. Um, so you can see already that um, indices, while common, are extremely susceptible to um, revealing the underlying, the underlying assumptions yeah, about how to generate it. And once again, are there units associated with these scores? No, it's just no. the speed ranking. Yeah, it's a weird, uh, indices are, are by, uh, usually considered unitless unless it so happens that all the underlying values have the same unit. Um, yeah. So very cool. I like your, your spreadsheet set up. And uh, any questions, comments for Steve? All right, great. I didn't, know about, I didn't know about this, being able to do this up here, so that was a good Nelson. Excellent. Yep, thanks. thanks Steve. Okay, um, nice work, fun stuff. So up next on our agenda is Tufty. I, I, whenever I get back to Tufty, I realize how nice it is to read great writing. Um, not only is the, are the ideas good, uh, if you haven't dug into one of the chapters, I encourage you to try to stay with us as we now move through sequentially starting next week on chapter two. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a golden, golden text. I think he's able to blend clarity on several different levels, which makes it an extremely effective learning tool. So I'm giving you an example. Let's review. Uh, let me finish that sentence. I'm giving you an example of a possible approach to designing your mini project. So if you'll join me, uh, all of our materials are in the shared Google Doc for Tufty, which is available um, on our, uh, I put it down under today's schedule. It's also linked uh, on our main page right here. And I think if I do F5, I corrected the spelling of his last name. So you can click that or the one in the schedule and you will see this. Um, so what I've done is I've attempted to use, um, I'm using the contents feature, which is very handy uh, for organizing large documents. So um, if you use the headers, uh, the built-in styling for headers, then when you insert the table of contents, you can tell it to just go ahead and read my headers and make a contents associated or contents of links to those headers. So you'll see this is an option for doing your display. Uh, you can also see from previous terms, you can uh, click through and look at it. You can choose whatever form you want um, in your presentation. You can see I moved our section, um, our assignments to the second section. And um, I will be transferring these over to our schedule um, shortly. But just remember, we've got uh, George. Are you on the line? I know Aaron's uh, off, um, but you're you're up next for next week with chapter two. Um, and so what I'm gonna will do now is I will demo how I uh, one idea for making this interactive. Um, and you'll see that right above the assignments was what we went over last week, which is um, this is not a presentation alone, but rather hopefully a, uh, an exercise that encourages members of the class to engage with the content intellectually somehow. Um, and that could be discussion based. Um, what we'll try tonight is an independent ranking activity and then a discussion, but we want to compress the key ideas of your chapter into some key points and uh, hopefully there'll be a critical mass of folks that have reviewed the chapter so we've got some in-depth knowledge as well as folks if you get busy and you don't get to the text um, the key points should help you help your brain grasp the key ideas and then we want to practice them right away so um, again we'll break the group into two so you'll have roughly six people in your group and um, preparing, over preparing is, is a good way to reduce stress. Uh, my most stressful teaching moments are the, the ones that I've under prepared for. So I encourage you, um, and what happens usually when I'm under prepared is I end up over talking because I haven't prepared exercises. And so I, my intuition is just to keep dumping 
um, and that re dramatically reduces the effectiveness of, of the exercise. So um, my suggestion is that you choose some overarching topic and uh, to Paula's sharing of the uh, hat note, I decided to use Wikipedia visualizations as my overarching topic. Last year I chose uh, noise pollution. So I think it will be helpful for you if you think about an exercise that asks people to assess or appraise visualizations that your brain, the brains have some commonality across them so that there's a, a basis for comparing the various features of those visualizations. So, Eric, um, I just have a quick question on this. Um, Drew, Drew and I are both supposed to do chapter two, and I know Aaron and George are supposed, I'm sorry, three, and are supposed to do two. Now, are we each supposed to do it independently and then we break into two separate rooms? Yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting okay. it as a group project, unless you want to. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to know, because I didn't, we didn't know how to get in touch with other people. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, uh, I generally, I'm always open to group work, but I, I try to not assign it unless it's curricular, um, because of my own preferences. So, uh, chapter one, uh, I took chapter one because it has my favorite visualization that I referenced on our very first night. Um, and so I'm going to present the key points in about uh, two or three minutes, uh, probably five in reality. And I encourage you to grab your books. Um, I'm having some AV technical technicalities, so I'm going to have to manually switch over to my dot cam. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my, you're going to get the integrated camera for a second um, while I switch devices. So. It's amazing how flaky low-end AV equipment from Amazon can be. Um, I've, it's been quite a project getting all of this set up. Okay. So once again, we are uh, working with a text that's original publication date was 83. So uh, from a computer standpoint, Folks, most folks did not have, um, you know, VisiCalc. When was VisiCalc? Seventy nine. Um, when was it? VisiCalc was Apple in seven. Yeah, seventy nine. So, very earliest tip of personal computing uh, visualization. So, the ones that he's displaying are were created with a great deal of of love and uh, potentially even hardship. Uh, so let's, I think that should be USA. Oh, wait. My little Elmo. My little Elmo is dead. Oh, thought it was the capture card. Okay, all standby. Okay, well, good thing I have the key visualization already in the Google Doc. Um, so let me pop that up. Uh, and this grays out. Okay, so if we pop down to my section on chapter one, I distilled what I uh, what I think were important key points from this exercise, this uh, this chapter, and that many of them will come up in more specificity as we move through Tofty. And so I didn't, I don't mean to steal anyone's steam. It's just I'm using a little bit of your steam, and you can uh, get the train moving on your end. So uh, a couple of the most important uh, components of a visualized display is multivariate analysis or multivariate representation. And Tofty makes the key point that for univariate analysis, almost always a tabular representation can be more compact and potentially uh, even more useful. So um, a simple uh, bar chart that's showing a scalar value for each of 10 categories like he uses on page. And uh, forgive me for um, 
you know what? We might even. Uh, he makes it nice and small um, on page 33 about uh, highly highly labeled data sets usually belong in tables. So instead, what he presents is a set of graphics that combine uh, at least two variables and potentially one of those variables or the third variable being time and or location. And so um, the exemplar that he uses and his, uh, his note on the Napoleonic War visualization is it may well be the best statistical graphic uh, of all time. So let's, let's use this since that's the one we have in front of us because poor little Elmo is tired. Um, why, why, why does this exhibit the key points of the chapter well? So we have a spatial component in that the location of the army marching, so we've got uh, France and Russia, and we have key geographic features like these major rivers uh, that might influence movement. And uh, so very clever in that it is, the, the spatial component is included, but it is sparse enough to completely not distract from the actual uh, quantitative display. Um, so the spatial layout of the data uh, conveys that spatial, um, the underlying spatial values without clutter. Um, and he calls that kind of clutter chart junk, uh, which is a whole whole section. So I won't belabor that too much. But I, what I want to emphasize is the multi-dimensional analysis that this conveys. So we get the spatial movement, we get a uh, a magnitude of army size represented by the width of the army's movement through space. So starting out with uh, a little under a half a million troops and we get a time series component uh, that moves along the x-axis as well. So this, this is extremely clever uh, and is very unique to this particular kind of display because we have uh, an event that takes place over time and it takes place over a spatial, uh, a deliberate spatial movement to a place trying to take over Russia and then a retreat from that place back to France. And so we get uh, space, we get magnitude, and we have time in an uncluttered graphic. Uh, which is uh, fantastic. And we also have temperature um, in Celsius. So the, uh, obviously the, the key thing that happened was they got, they got frozen. Um, things, the, the Russian winters are uh, very brutal. Uh, and so this is the exemplar of the eye is drawn to exactly the important features of this graphic, which is this was a catastrophic loss of human life that occurred during an army's march that contained a number of uh, breakoffs. We The clever way in which we see a retreat of a component of the army was spatially organized in the figure and kept fidelity to the notion that the width of the bar conveys the size of the troops that pertain to this given movement. Um, extremely clever stuff. And this came out of, um, what was a year on this? Uh, 1967. Um, so um, very unique. So we jump back to our key points. So blending location, time, and magnitude. Uh, this was not univariate, so we didn't need to use a table. Um, the idea of comparison is critical, and that goes with the third and fourth bullets, which is we are often attempting to provide contrast between various subdivisions of the data. In our case, the comparison here is the attack and then the retreat, and that comparison is shown by the shading of the army bar, uh, the lined being the 
uh, the invasion, and then the solid black being the retreat. So we, we intuitively get a sense by seeing the large lined bar depart and something like, uh, um, uh, like two and a half percent return. So the width of this bar conveys the magnitude of the tragedy that this, this leader engaged in uh, for, I guess, history has a lot to say about Napoleon's leadership style. Um, this is what I mean by facilitates compare, oh, there's my delayed zoom on Google, sorry. So it facilitates this comparison um, in, a, in a very graphically simple way, but also a way that shows you exactly uh, the scale of disaster that we're talking about um, by comparing how many left and how many came back. So the degree to which the graphic design can help the eye do that is a key focus of a visualization comparisons. And of course, the important, with, important idea of comparison is the eye will be drawn to all sorts of details. We're very visual creatures. And so the degree to which we can design a graphic to draw in the very comparisons that we think the data are, are most apt to share uh, is, is a crucial design uh, component. Um, this is uh, something that Tofti will mention throughout the book, which is when possible, a well-designed graphic, the methodology by which it was created uh, should be relatively transparent. So I'm a big fan of meaningful captions, but if the caption is required to get any extraction of meaning from the graphic, it's probably the case that we have not rendered the methodology transparent enough. And um, this is a, a great example of I'm not, uh, I'm not burdened by uh, how the data were assembled. I'm rather able to see the data uh, for itself. Um, and the other uh, last two, uh, I guess the last factor before his summary is how can we add a granularity to the data? And this is awfully easy in today's slippy map world. So in the slippy map world, we can choose our granularity by uh, just panning in and the panning action asks the server for a different level of granularity. So if I zoom in on the shop, I'm seeing a macro level of detail, and then I'm actually changing the figure when I zoom in and I pull a new layer from Google Maps server in real time to uh, get to something with a lot more embedded detail. Um, but how can we do that in a figure itself uh, is that static is potentially trickier. So to what degree does this show us level of granularity? Um, not as much. This may not be the best example of multiple levels of scale, um, but because of my uh, doc cam issues, I can't pull up these others easily. Yeah, is, is there a vertical axis component? The vertical mm -hmm. axis is is the spatial data. So okay. So just, it's like yeah. a, it's like an X Y. We have a whole spatial X Y. Um, the vertical here is um, temperature. So we get vertical down here, uh, and then this is X Y coordinate. Okay, so it's kind of like a map. It's a map and a graph. Going west to east, east to west. Yep. Okay, and the black is the retreat. And the right is the is the attack. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Very neat. Um, and so the way the top two summarizes it is strive for a unity of substance. So do I is there data to display? Uh, we don't want to attempt to ex to create meaning in the graphic that is not in the underlying data. Uh, statistic meaning how do we need to aggregate or slice the data? in order to facilitate uh, the creation of the graphic and then design. How do we facilitate co a comparison? 
how do we render the methodology transparent such that the eye and the spatial arrangement of the features conveys the meaning rather than having it to be included as supplemental material. Um, anyone else that uh, dug into chapter one want to uh, facilitate anything? I want, I've got to zoom in on the small multiples because it's, it's brilliant. Let me see how I can do this. Uh, I wonder if these, these probably will, this will probably Eric, work. what page is it, what page is that on? I have the PDF if you want me to share it. Yeah, 42. Let me shut my screen share. Thank you. I have this big mega earth magnet. I'm always worried I'm going to drop it on my laptop and lose everything. <laughs> I still have a spinning disk hard drive in there. Look, there's the small multiples. Look how great. Thank you, Brandon. So the idea of a small multiple is to facilitate comparison by repeating a structure in the graphic, meaning this particular map of the greater Los Angeles County area and giving us that same structural plane multiple times and then displaying only the, uh, and then the differing values between those displays are those things to which we want to draw the eye. So we've got three uh, pollution, um, three uh, gaseous uh, components that are emitted by urban life and we get so this is very clever because we're getting space the uh, we get actually a, a attempted a three-dimensional rendering so we get the greater Los Angeles area spatial we have on the x-axis we have time and on the y-axis we have three different pollutants um, so once again excellent example of the this uh, how many axes, uh, definitely more than one, ideally potentially three can be engaged in. So because each of the figures, the only thing that's different is the magnitude of the various gaseous pollutants and their location, the eye is immediately uh, led to pan across the rows to see, okay, I can imagine a uh, a commute happening in my second column. So I can imagine our carbon monoxide jumping up on the second column of the middle row. Um, and then we have uh, general flurry during the day, not particularly much of a decrease, and then evening rush hour uh, on the end. So your eye is um, able to con see magnitude. This is a great example of having multiple levels of uh, detail. Uh, our eyes can sense a major spike uh, between rush hour and night, uh, but if we want to, we can, we can draw our face way in and look in particular parts of a county and think about why might there be a, a peak way over in Riverside County right in, right in the edges. So uh, another excellent example, small multiples, various granularities of detail, and the methodology is obvious. Um, we have that nice little inset map that shows us how it works, and then the eye is just kind of led to soak it up. Extremely cool, extremely clever. Um, comments on that? I could fi I find myself looking at these a lot because there's, uh, and again, th this is this is not fancy glitzy stuff. Um, this is the the data in in a strategically designed digested format uh, that composes millions of pieces of information uh, simplified out. Okay, so here's your, here's your activity. Thank you, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, if you'll jump back in the Google Doc, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes, uh, and thank you again to Paula for inspiring this. Um, what I've assembled are four artifacts related to visualizations of Wikipedia data. And each of the artifacts have an associated link. You'll need to poke around in this one to figure out what it's all about. So I, I want to give you a full 15 minutes to try this. So what I'm going to ask you to do is review each of the four artifacts, 
related to Wiki visualization of Wikipedia interconnections and data. Um, and here's Miles Davis. Oh no, it got too big. So there's your artifact one, two, three, and four. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to assign each of you rows uh, right now while I'm showing this to you. Where's my toolbar? So I'm going to ask you to rank from strongest to weakest based on the key points that we have in chapter one. So if you've got the book, it might be worth taking a few minutes and, uh, uh, he does a good job on the very first page to list, um, some key bullet points of, of, in fact, the entire book. So an easy way to wade into it. Um, so I'm going to put your name here. So you each get a row. Um, and I'm going to ask you to not, uh, I'm going to ask you to assemble your rankings on a different document until the very end, because we don't want any, um, we don't want to poison the well, so to speak, or we don't want, want to allow for independent uh, thinking. So George, Joanne, Kayla. And Zach, okay. So let's say it's um, 57 now. So we'll, let's say right at, uh, Right at 7.15, I'll ask you to put in your nomination. So what you're going to write are the names of the artifacts in the various columns. So that way we can easily compare. Um, so you'll actually write the name of the artifact in your chosen column. And then a sentence or two of uh, explanation will be very helpful. Um, so I'd write that in a separate document and then just paste it into justification. So something like, um, why did your strongest, what was it that drew you to strongest uh, or weakest? If you feel like none of them are very strong, you can certainly double up. This is not some sort of, um, they're not some master controller here. Um, the point is I want you to get a chance to apply the key points from the chapter. Um, so this will be kind of cool because I chose, I, I um, was proud of myself, I chose a professional sporting uh, graphic, even though I'm not quite sure. Um, I think it's football. That looks like a football. Um, so some interesting stuff going on with the connections between um, uh, nodes within the Wiki Wikimedia space. So 15 minutes uh, and give it a try. Questions? Where's this document? Sorry. This document is linked on our homepage and the schedule. It's called Tough Tufty Notes. Oh, okay. If you do a search for T-U-F-T-E, it'll pop right up. Okay. So remember, we're looking for which ones show us multi-dimensions, uh, different levels of granularity, which ones can allow the eye to make quick comparisons. We want to facilitate comparisons because usually it's the comparisons that draw out the meaning behind the data that we're looking at. All right. And we just kind of rank them. You will, you will, you will rank them. Good. Okay. Okay. So 15 minutes, have fun. I'm going to put on hat, hat note in the background, of course. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll call at, uh, at 14 minutes from now, I'll call for you to start pasting in your uh, your uh, justifications and your rankings. All right. Give me a hand, hand, uh, raise your digital hand if you know what we're doing. We're all set. You're out there. Look at those nice little hands. I wish you could color them. That would be kind of fun. And you could say, I'm more or less clear. Okay. Great. Chelsea, George, Duran, you're okay? Super. Okay, I'll see you in 15. Have fun. And here's Hat Note, Visual, Wikipedia via audio.
Okay, let's see. Let's see if we've got some uh, con consensi. Oh, it's really fun to see this all coming in. Okay. Um, Well, you're also thorough. Very impressive. Okay, do we have? This is a good. This is a good rough. Uh, rough analytics process. So, is anyone? Obviously, how many times does Mr. Davis make it into our strongest? Three, four, five, six. And is he ever making it in low? So we've got Rachel. So it looks like Life Map and Miles Davis were tying for strongest or middle stronger. And NFL and geolinguistics. That's we got this is quite a bit of quite a bit of consensus. Now, interestingly, um, Oh, why is it paused? My screen sharing is paused. I wanted to resume recording. Okay, pause recording. All right, so let, let's get a little conversation going here. So uh, we've got Zach has NFL uh, in the strongest category, whereas almost everybody was putting NFL in either the weakest or uh, middle week. So let me put those side by side and let's see if we can uh, discuss a little bit about uh, how these, um, why we ranked the way we did. So we've got, there's Mr. Davis. We'll put him there and then we'll put our supporting here. So Zach, since you were divergent, uh, why don't you make a case? Um, so this was, I, I evaluated it based on um, uh, the concepts uh, that were in the chapter. Um, and I felt that the, uh, the NFL chart was probably, uh, it used, um, I guess, the multivariate uh, elements pretty well. You know, you've got at the top, you've got basically seeing, um, uh, traffic um, to the particular cluster. Um, you've got, you know, you're ranking by teams over time, your views to the main page. And at, at the far right, you've got a scale for uh, density, which is a good standard for magnitude. Like I, I understand that with all of these, I had to click, click through to the uh, web page to kind of get some context. And uh, I think it's like, I think they all sort of fail in like appropriately setting the context and sort of explaining what they do, um, particularly the geolinguistics one. Yeah. Um, but I think the NFL one sort of is the most novel and most interesting in its approach. And the only reason I knocked the Miles Davis one was I feel like in terms of design, um, the, the minimalistic approach, I think, kind of robbed us of some important touchstones uh, you know, that, you know, some, some numbers, I think that would have been a little more helpful to make it a stronger, uh, candidate. Okay. So that's, um, that's a good case, uh, for NFL. Now let's hear some weak points of NFL. We had, uh, Steve was all the way at the bottom. Um, Joanne also, uh, weakest Brandon also weakest. Why so weak? The book said, serve a reasonably clear purpose. <laughs> what? I can't look at this and know what it says. I do know that there was a trophy given out in February. Oh, is that what that is? is but that I, like, I know the New England Patriots won, but I don't know what this actually is without going and reading about it. Comparatively to the Miles Davis one, I can look at it and know what it is. 
each dot represents some number. I don't know what that number is, but it's a it's a it's a function of mentions. So that's why I ranked NFL low. As I just I looked at it, I'm like it's a cluster of too much data. With not enough explanation. I feel like the NFL, like they, it's good, but it's just, it's, if they broke it down into like two, like half of the teams in one chart and a half the other, I don't know. That would be easier. Uh, how, it, as in too many teams were, were listed? Yeah, I think it's just too much clutter at, like, I get, I understand the point, but I think just going in and then seeing the, um, yeah, so I guess I was looking more for, like, half of the teams in one chart and half the teams in another chart as, like, visually sound. Okay, so you were, you were overwhelmed by the density of data. Yeah. Um, I'm just reviewing the description here. Um, Related to that, it's not in alphabetical order. It's in no perceptible order. There might be an order, but I don't know what it is. The NFL. If you want to find a team, you have to have to keep going down the list to find your team. Yep, there was no, like, maybe if you could uh, sort it or have some kind of change in visualization that gave you more information on it. Um, and it also included non-season months. And I just kind of felt like, you know, it didn't give like time point information. It just seemed like it was lacking a lot of items that could have easily been included to make it a lot more meaningful. Yeah, so is it my, it's my interpretation that this scaling here, the, the order, the vertical order of the teams has nothing to do with this scaling on the right. Is that other people's interpretation? That this was just a, this is trying to show me what these, shades represent so yeah. kind of, we lose we lose a verticality for anything other than the uh the green plot which is the timeline shows the overall cluster activity um the behavior of the wikipedia visitors during the day of the final is outstanding the activity of the nfl fans is much higher comparing to the activity of the other Wikipedia users. It makes an analogy to the real life when during the finals, the fans become the most active people on the streets. Um, yeah, I like, I like Joanne's point. We get, um, it's not even a year. So we have, what did you call these? Not off season or post season? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're off season months. So like, it's just, there's no data. Yeah. And, and the fact that we lost all of our verticality axis meaning is a big, that's a big um, gaffe. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not like you can manipulate anything to get more data out of it. Yeah. Where the others, you could extrapolate more data from them. Yeah. And so we, get, we also get, we get this, uh, these are, this must be cluster visualization by month. So, um, but we don't have, did we get a key for the red? Is that the winning teams? Yeah, that that, the that, that's team? for the two teams that went to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Those are the fan base for those two. So I, I, this is when I realized how this, this was. Um, so it kind of just shows how, how was this measured? This is like people talking about it, right? I actually was only looking at the picture when we were given the time to study this, and I thought it was the worst. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize it had this more to it. Yeah. Um. So how how was that measured? Like, it's just a. Uh, what's the? Is that a person like with a? Of that fan base posting a comment about something or mentioning the Super Bowl on Facebook or something like that. So I want to comment on Steve's question. Um, uh, 
when I looked at it, it's it's kind of it's interactive. By the way, when you click up uh, uh, some of them, like some of those pictures, it becomes interactive, and you can change a few things and and see them. Uh, me, my problem was it is that um, it's kind of discriminatory, if I if I may use that word. You, to, to understand it, you either have to kind of love and understand visualizations, the interactivity and how to change it to, you also have to be a football fan, like like all of us, even, even right now, we don't understand some of the things, but when you go into it more and click on the pictures, it's interactive and it can show you more data, but it's, it's kind of, um, to me, it's kind of discriminatory that you have to to know certain things uh, like be good in visualization and love it or love football yeah. to really understand it. So it's not some of those graphs where you look at it at once and you can have some something they are comparing. This one you have to go too, too much into it. But when you devolve into it, um, it's kind of interactive and you can can see other things but even then I think it's somewhere where you there are so many words put together that you can't even read them at some, at certain yeah, point. yeah well said um, this would be to George's point that you have to dig in and look more this is what we mean by the methodology is not transparent meaning yeah. we are um, as viewers hopefully we're curious enough to even figure out what the methodology is to make sense of the graph, but maybe not. Um, so uh, I would say this is a, a compelling non-example of something that has visual flair, um, visualizing network data as they did, um, has flair. The coloring is somewhat interesting, but um, like Rachel said, may maybe splitting out um, this is this is a jumble and the order doesn't convey meaning so we lost we lost that access so let's go back to our rankings and see um, now we've got Miles Davis so this was ranked highly um, someone that hasn't had a chance to chime in yet what are the strengths of this I think one of the biggest is the methodology is clear that's what I was looking for in all of them and could you describe that more and to me, it looks like it's a histogram and the title says clearly like what it is, like page mentions. And then it's just like, I can tell like they just counted up the page mentions and put them in a histogram. So like, I know what happened, you know, whereas with the NFL one and the geolinguistics one, I had no idea how they got those conclusions. Yeah. So methodology is clear. Um, anyone want to um, propose any other strengths? This was a highly rated graph. The interactiveness, like interactability, I don't know the word, how interactive it is, um, how detailed it is, and like, you know, it's it's given like, it's, it's like it's populated with information, like it's being fed in from another web, you know, Wikipedia basically, you know, in the way that you can reorder and isolate different types of, um, Articles, you know, like recordings, people, places, other, you know, I think that's really cool. I mean, the histogram is really, I mean, like the way that you can, yeah, isolate the different types of things and, you know, it just moves and it looks really good. Um, yeah, and the way you just kind of end up just getting lost, just kind of hovering your mouse over different stuff and then it like highlights what he, you know, his name. I think it's just really cool like the way that they got all the whatever this is html or i don't know what software you create this probably with. c3 yeah e3 yeah i uh, I'd bet the farm on that let's check um other strengths this so this was the this was in my view so this we should be able to look at source and i'll bet um d3 will pop right up uh, I think the key milestones, which is the release of the, these key albums, is uh, gives you uh, some markers that are really very helpful. Yeah, and uh, 
the fact that we this this is a great the computer world has made um, the different resolutions of data far more possible because you can have the individual um, musician components and mentions in these dots um, that can be called upon without delay. And that's the kind of thing that's very difficult to do in a static uh, diagram. But this is, I think that's probably one of the, the if, you're, if you're attempting to build something like this and you have at your disposal um, JavaScript like this, this is a great example. And it even lets you jump all the way into the actual underlying data. So yeah. I, I like, um, I think we're picking up on, there's a, there's a cleanliness to it that is um, critical. One of Tofti's major metrics in assessing a graphic that uh, you'll get to in the later chapters is the data to ink ratio. And this is so high because it's, it's a histogram in which each of the stacked components is itself um, a representative of an entire node full of data um, in itself. So we have a very high data to ink ratio. Almost every line, every piece of ink, so to speak, has data behind it. There's no extra, um, there's almost no extra lines. Uh, this is very, this is a, a nice common new design where if you can get rid of the lines, um, get rid of them. And he has a couple of good examples in later chapters where he gives you the same graphic with and without uh, chart lines to illustrate this. So uh, we're in agreement that this is an extremely strong um, graphic. What, what improvements um, could you imagine? Eric, 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 the one thing that I think is, is important to mention about this is that the, the image itself has meaning. It looks like a cityscape at night with reflections in the water. So if you can imagine you're looking at Manhattan across from New yeah. Jersey or something, that's it. So I think that's really appropriate for Miles Davis. I didn't even think of that. Um, design is very clever there. Um, yeah, what other comments did we get inside here? Yeah, so methodology uh, was, we would say, tra very transparent. And we didn't have to wonder, we didn't have to dig into the, the how in order to get the what. Um, so now let's uh, let's tackle the geolinguistics. I deliberately included the geolinguistics um, because I too was uh, underwhelmed. Um, would someone like to um, take a hatchet to our geolinguistics? We, first of all, the reason I did this was because it's a good example of what feature that we talked about. It's in the key points. having parallel structures. It's, sim it's sort of similar to the, uh, to the small multiples in a way. Yeah, so we have this idea. It, it is a small multiple, it's two. Um, do you wanna take a critique of that, Zach? Where did you put yours? Uh, where did you put it in your ranking? Uh, I put it in last, which is kind of disappointing because it's a pretty interesting topic. Um, but I just kind of felt like, you know, you pull it up, you have no idea what you're looking at. You, you see these, um, you know, you see these touchstones or rather you see these points that are on this graph, right? But you have no idea just by, without hovering over it, you have no idea what they represent. You know, are they, you know, what, what exactly in terms of like the geolinguistic contrasts are we looking at? Is it, is it part of the language usage? Is it knowledge? It just doesn't really like resonate with me. It just kind of, it's cool, but you know, it's, I don't really know what I'm looking at. Yeah. And we don't get any hovers uh, on some of the key features. Um, that's the other handy thing about interactive components is if strategically used, the hover and tool tips can get you a long way to declutter complicated things while not losing information, which is hard to do in, in print media. Did anyone dig in enough to try to describe to us more about um, 
what what we're learning about here? It's a pretty complicated topic. It's like measuring. It's plotting. If you click on one of the dots, it'll show you. It'll bring up an article, and where it's based. So, um, and it'll show you like the closest relative one to, um, like in in the English one. So on the left, you'll see like all those dots represent an article that are that take place there, and on the right is the English equivalent. So I guess it's sort of like. <clears throat> you know, how based on like the locale it's in, like how knowledgeable are each. So you can sort of compare to say like, oh, like the English Wikipedia is, you know, fairly knowledgeable in terms of some of the, com uh, compared to its German counterpart in Germany. But it's like, again, you really have to dig in and try and figure out like, what what is this? It's yeah. like, you have to, read the abstract and the methodology to understand like the hell's this, going on. This is a great example of the tooltip or the, um, the pop-up being extremely unhelpful. Um, it doesn't even give you a title um, or explain what we mean by backlink. Um, and I uh, think Zach, Zach happens to work in linguistics analysis. So <laughs> I expected you to have a couple of things to say about this. That's yeah, why this it was, was so disappointing. Yeah, this was a tragedy because the the design of the system is really clever. I think the the small multiples with the graphs that mirror each other um, is extremely effective at comparisons. You know, that's the thing that that our brains are really good at is if uh, we're able to differentiate or we're able to isolate the differences between two things very clearly. And the coloring uh, draws out the actual data. They didn't choose. A, uh, a distracting base map. The, the base map components are, are very sparse, just sparse enough to give you a sense for where things are if you, if you know Berlin or the world. So um, from a design perspective, I think there's a lot of strength. Um, but in terms of extracting meaningful information, um, we are left wanting. Um, and, and now for the life map, which was, um, I could, uh, a life map I included because um, it inspires that it, 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 it is in my opinion, the, uh, uh, takes advantage of the exciting nature of the zoomability and the, uh, I guess we'd call this the, the fractal nature of the network data and extremely well designed. Now I think who, uh, who ranked this high? Who'd like to take a stab that hasn't spoken much? We had, uh, um, Joanne, you ranked it uh, strongest, and Paula also, Rachel R also. Any comments on um, which features you were seeing in this? And uh, most of you ranked it in the second highest too. So we obviously get the um, resolutions of data is facilitated um, to, to a stunning degree as we zoom. Um, to show interrelationships um, between uh, the, the species taxonomy. So amazing uh, resolution. Uh, comments from the Raiders. I like that you could see the labels that are to and from on the edges whenever you really blew it up too. So it was yeah. hard to get lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably one of the most striking things to me also was that you were always, it, it always maintained um, perspective as you went deeper into it. Um, and you could really go in as deep as you wanted to without getting, like if you were looking for a specific relationship, you could actually go as deep as you wanted to to get that specific relationship without being clouded by all this other information. Um, so it was really, it kind of kept the noise of the, the volume of information down if you yeah. wanted. Right, so we had a very good data to ink ratio. Um, and even the design, the, the, the graphic design around how the density of nodes and edges scales um, 
is extremely visually compelling um, and allows for comparison. It makes you want, it makes, the differences make me want to explore um, this variation across this particular phyla of bacteria. It, it, it just makes me want to tinker with it because even the, um, we get a sense for, uh, I like it because it also gives, gives us a sense for the, the vastness of our uh, biological taxonomy systems that we are, um, it, is, it, is, it is dramatic and I think it portrays that drama very nicely. Um, there was there was a company in Squirrel Hill that was a, a, a while back who was, was doing a visual search engine who came up with something like this and then it was bought by another company and it came out of um, oh, what Catherine I can't remember her name out of CMU who did network it, who did um, groups you know like uh, like uh, group analysis where you basically well like almost social networks. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, that this was a vi this method was a visual um, search engine, and you could you could really do it this way. So this is not new. This is just applied to Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? Was there? I wonder. I'd have to. I did not have enough time to dig into the underlying bits. I think there. I read down here that. Um, I think it's open source. Um, I'm wondering what the platform, but Eric, um, yeah. This visual, I have, I had this one. I looked at it. I, I loved it, and I'm like, um, again, it's, it's made for specific people. Yeah. Not everyone, and at the first sight, you, you can't really, really understand like information right away. That clarity is lacking. Yeah. But that first shot, I wanted to know this information. So I know they were trying to put as much information into like one diagram where you go here and go deep and go deep and go deep and go deeper. But, you know, a visual is supposed to kind of portray information that I, I would have uh, spent maybe five minutes reading uh -huh. that I use one minute to understand it. But when you go to this visual, you are going to spend another five minutes sometimes to find this one aspect that you want because you have to click to this branch and click to that branch that takes you to the other branch and the other branch. So it's, it's, it's advantage that, uh, that is kind of a source of advantage. It makes it only for those people who are really, really interested in having yeah. this information not for anyone who can just look at it and says, oh, it's about this. And this compares to this. So you have to know it, you have to understand it, you have to love visuals and why. And I think the, 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 when I was reading this Tato book and does one of his, his arguments, especially in the first chapters of, uh, he even gives you the history of why visuals are important. And, uh, that was my one of my most critics. Yes, I'm studying data analytics. Yes, I'm, I may go deeper, but if you are putting a visual, you are trying to say, okay, uh, instead of you reading so many paragraphs in five or 10 minutes, yeah. yes, look at it in one minute and understand what we are about. But that figure doesn't give it to me. I have to go deeper and deeper and deeper, the same as Okay, it might solve reading because these are scientific things, but it doesn't give that uh, that ease that in the first place was the reason why I'm going for a vision. Yeah, George, you do a very good job at articulating those those critiques from the book of um, 
there it's a reliant on a domain potentially more reliant on domain knowledge than um than we might ideally like this this is the kind of platform i think that the fact that very little shows up on the right that's useful um it seems like they have a lot of containers that could help to your point um because they have such a strong foundation of data uh that the visualization lends itself to taxonomic classifications in a network. So I think to your point, um, more, way more could be done with this sidebar. I think, um, we get, we can get the, the movement down the tree, but very little by way of explanation. It does almost feel like a technical tool, um, for uh, biologists, um, and people that like network data. So, um, other comments, Drew? Any comments out there? Thinking people no that comment. haven't spoken much. What was that, Drew? No, um, no comments. Okay. Um, well, so I, I have to I have to restrain myself because I think it's uh, really great. Um, so thanks for that discussion. Um, I I propose this activity not as something necessarily for you to copy. Uh, but a starter place for trying to give you encouragement to plan an exercise for the group that's not one way, but facilitates discussion. So be, be clever and creative. Uh, this is your chance to say, all right, we've got people, we've got Google Docs at our disposal, we've got Zoom breakout rooms. Um, if you're doing your presentation, uh, I guess, I don't think we have sub breakout rooms, unfortunately. So I was going to offer breakout rooms, but I I think I'll have to use them to, to put you in the two groups, but please try, please put in uh, some serious time to make our, our, uh, our class time interesting for our top two chapters. So um, my sad story on the pivot tables is I, I was, I'm working on planning a really nice exercise and I was digging into what I thought was going to be really rich data with, um, all of our global indexes and I was getting really excited, but I, I feel like I, um, I, I have not found the data set that really allows us to um, pivot in a, in a useful way. So I'm going to defer uh, pivoting for one more week and hopefully I can find something that's, um, that's better. I really, I really can't stand the thought of just, hacking through pivot tables without something cool. So I'm going to look, I'm going to look for a better data set than our human development indexes um, and propose that we call it a night for tonight. Um, so I think because this week has no outstanding assignments, this is your week to dig into your visualize yourself. Um, if you haven't built your framework in Markdown, this is the week to tinker with Markdown um, and to try your beta tools. And so what I'd like to do is start next week with a breakout uh, for um, probably three breakout rooms for uh, for the Visualize Yourself project. Maybe one, one for Markdown, uh, maybe one for project design, and one for um, like sampling and tool building. Because a lot of us have, uh, it seems like a lot of us are thinking about gathering data about a life process uh, about which we really want to minimize the cost of that data gathering. I think the, the key will be for the data to be meaningful is that it needs to be gatherable quick enough that you'll actually persist over the course of a month, month and a half at gathering that data. And so that's a high bar. So like for Joanne, interruptions, adding one more task to an interruption, that's, you know, she, she's got a, a, a high bar on your tool design to make it not an additional distraction, which is a cool design process. Um, as researchers, the, the cost of gathering that data uh, can be extremely high uh, when we're thinking about if you're having a whole bunch of people carry out an exercise. So I, I hope you, I hope and encourage you to think uh, carefully this week about your Visualize Self project. And um, then George, remember you're up next week. And um, Paula, could you remind Aaron if you see him about his sign up for next week and uh, uh, sure i know he already did uh, a lot of work on that oh, it, great. It so will be he's, it's in his brain into a tool yeah okay. yep yeah, yep yeah. so if if we get this posted then he can watch it probably tomorrow to get an idea of how to present 
Okay. Um, I will, I will commit to uploading it to, uh, um, we video by noon tomorrow. <laughs>